Last week's talk was called, Are You Really a Buddhist? So today is part two, and it's called, How Much Rituals Should a Buddhist Do? For the sake of those people who did not come last week, I'm going to give you a summary of what I talked about so that you can piece things together. Last week, I started off by asking, what is a Buddhist? Well, the word Buddhist is a modern invention. During the Buddhist time, we don't call people who believe in the Buddha's teachings Buddhists. They were called Upasaka Upasika, male lay followers and female lay followers. So a lay follower is defined as one who goes to the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha for refuge. You did that this morning, right? You all said Buddhang, Saranang, Chami and so forth. So by doing that, if you already understand what you did, then you are already a Buddhist, an Upasaka and Upasika, one who follows the teachings of the Buddha, who has taken refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. I'm sure that although many of you claim to be Buddhists, you take refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma, and the Sangha, and you've probably recited that many times in your lifetime. Are you impeccable in the five precepts? No, right? Yeah. So, although you're a Buddhist, you're not necessarily a virtuous Buddhist, because a virtuous Buddhist is defined as one who not only takes refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, but who observes the five precepts. Then I went on to talk about two types of upasaka or lay follower that was defined in the sutta. The first is a low class one and the second is a high class one. The low class one is called an outcast upasaka, a dirty upasaka and a substandard or deplorable upasaka. And the high class one is called a jewel upasaka a lotus upasaka, a white lotus upasaka. Which one do you want to be? You want to be low class or high class? High class, huh? Okay. <laughs> you don't know what you're going in for. <laughs> okay, so what constitutes an outcast, dirty, deplorable or substandard upasaka? There are five factors involved. The first one is he does not have faith, no belief. He simply say Buddha, Sarananga Chami, Dhamman Sarananga Chami, and so forth, but don't know exactly what he's doing, and don't know who the Buddha is, don't know what the Dhamma is, don't know what the Sangha is. And not only don't know, don't even have faith. Don't believe that the Buddha was actually perfectly self-enlightened, self-awakened, thinking that the Buddha is just another Angkong another deity that you can pray to and make wishes when you get into trouble and he will save you like Bonin Ma. Okay, number one. Number two, not virtuous. So, unless you're impeccable in the five precepts, then you are still outcast, low-class Upasaka. <laughs> okay, the third one is that this low-class or outcast Upasaka is superstitious. He believes in omens and signs. And he goes after blessings and does not believe in karma. Instead of believing in karma, he believes in blessings. I'm sure many of you here subscribe to Bong Sui, right? No, huh? there are probably many here who do. And signs and omens, when you see certain things happening, and then, oh, that's a bad sign, shouldn't do this, shouldn't do that. Uh, that is being superstitious. And then you all also like to invite monks to come to your house to do blessings, no? Ah, but monks actually can't bless you. They don't have the power to bless you. You are not like the almighty God who has the grace and can bless you with good fortune and safety and protection. So to think that monks can actually bless you is a wrong view. And to go after that makes you a dirty upasaka. So don't invite me to your house for blessings, huh? <laughs> what we usually do after you give dana is that we are not actually blessing you. Although people say blessing, blessing. We are thanking you. Thanksgiving. 
thanking you for feeding us poor monks who don't cook and don't work for a living. So instead of believing in the law of karma, doing good karma to improve your lot, you go after blessings. Invite monks, powerful Rinpoches, very senior monks to come to your house and do blessing or go for empowerment ceremony, thinking that you can get all those worldly fortunes and successes and protection. Very easy, right? It's just like people, when they're sick, they prefer to go and see a doctor, even a TCM physician. Get medicine, eat the medicine and be well. How many would prefer to go and see a Qigong master and practice Qigong to heal yourself? Right? You know how much time they spend in Qigong to heal yourself? Uh? It's almost like going for an intensive meditation retreat. <laughs> Morning until night, they just practice Qigong to heal themselves of cancer. But instead of doing that by themselves, most people prefer the convenience of just going for radiotherapy, chemotherapy, eating herbs, taking medication. Right? So same thing. People go for blessings and empowerment ceremony because it's the easy way out. No need to work. Just go there, pay money, and get your successes and your protection. Okay, so there's a third factor. It's not so easy to become a high class of Pasaka, huh? <laughs> the fourth one is maybe easier. La. An outcast, dirty, substandard Upasaka would look for people worthy of offerings outside of the Buddhist Sangha. Go and look for other renunciants, other mediums, or people who claim to have psychic powers. Go there and make offerings to them, thinking that they are the greatest field of merit. I'm sure you have heard of people chanting, Supadipanno Bhagavato Tavaka Sango. Yeah, yeah, it says that the community of the Buddha's disciples is the incomparable field of merits. If you think otherwise, you go and see some other community thinking that they've got more psychic powers, they're more impressive, then you fall under this category. This is the fourth factor. And the fifth factor is giving priority over there giving them priority rather than priority to the Buddhist Sangha. Because these are the five factors. So, looking at these five factors, do you think you qualify to be a lotus to Pasaka, which is the opposite? One who has full faith in the Buddha, believes that the Buddha was perfectly and correctly self-awakened. And as a consequence of that, what he teaches us is out of his own experience and is true. And also there are followers of the Buddha who had followed his teachings and had become awakened. That is number one. Number two is that you are impeccable in the five precepts. Number three is that you are not superstitious. You don't subscribe to all these signs and omens. You don't go after blessings and you do your own work. Karma. Believe in the law of karma. And number four is that you understand that the well-practiced Tanga is the incomparable field of merits. And so, when you're looking to plant merits, you look for it within the Bodhi Sangha, not outside. The fifth one is that you don't give priority over there. It does not mean that you are not encouraged to give charity to other causes. For example, there are so many calamities happening around the world. It doesn't mean that you are discouraged from giving contributions in cash or kind. This is talking about making merits. But if you really have compassion and you want to help people, you can help anyone of any religion, whether they are highly attained or not. That's not the criteria. The criteria is that they are suffering and you are there to help them to overcome their suffering, to relieve them of their suffering. Okay, so in order to qualify to become a jewel of an upasaka, a lotus upasaka, a uh, pure white lotus to Pasaka, then you have to fulfill all these five. Otherwise, you are an outcast, dirty, substandard Upasaka. Okay, now looking at this definition of an Upasaka, of a lay Buddhist, and the classification of an Upasaka into high class and low class, where do you think the role of rites and rituals fall? Are they included anywhere in these two? 
definition of the Upasaka is one who goes to the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha for refuge. And then the five factors for determining what sort of Upasaka you are. Has number three, which is closely related to this, which is being superstitious or not, and going after blessings and not believing in karma or the reverse. Right? So actually, to become a good Upasaka does not require you getting involved in any rites and rituals at all. And yet, we all know that Buddhism is full of rites and rituals, even more so in Tibetan and Mahayana Buddhism. Right? What is my personal experience with regard to rites and rituals? I come from Palautikus. That was where I grew up. And nearby, there's this sleeping Buddha temple. And opposite that, there's a Burmese temple. And there's just about five or ten minutes walk from my house. But I never really had any faith in Buddhism. Although my parents or my grandma because she's got some Burmese blood. She used to go to the Burmese temple and they do offerings during big occasions like I think Vesa Day and after Wasa, Katina. So my first exposure to Buddhist monks was when my grandma passed away, when I was in secondary school. So I saw the monks invited from the temple come and then they do chanting, collect the ampao and go back. So that was my impression of what Buddhism is. Although I'm supposed to be a Buddhist, form filler Buddhist at that time. So, although I was very spiritually inclined in my childhood, I never had much respect for Buddhism because of this impression I get. What do monks do? All day they go around chanting, collect kampao, go back, (laughs) and what do they do? (laughs) So, my early search was more towards Western philosophy and psychology. And later only, in my university days, due to the influence of some friends, then I came back to the East and started to explore Eastern wisdom. And then when I was inspired to be more interested in Buddhism through Zen, but because I don't know Chinese, don't know Japanese, couldn't find a Zen master in Penang, I took a second choice, tried out Theravada instead. There was the Malaysian Buddhist Meditation Center in Penang, and they were teaching meditation. Somebody gave me a book written by Mahasi Sado about the fundamentals or vipassana exercises or something like that. And then when I read it, I said, hey, this is Zen, but it's put in a very systematic way. <laughs> so that's how I got involved in Theravada Buddhism. As I got myself more and more inspired, then my worldly interests began to fall away. No more interested in wanting to be a top scorer or pursuing my worldly interests at that time. So I was going towards renunciation. Very inspired by those Zen masters who stay up in the hills alone and uh, self-reliant. Then somebody gave me that book and I found out, hey, that's interesting. There's something like Zen, trying to stay in the present moment, but doing it in a very systematic way. So I went to MBMC, went to the library, started to read. And the Buddhism I read was so different from the Buddhism that I was exposed to. Then I began to really distinguish between what is supposed to be real practicing Buddhism and the sort of things that we do, which is the roja of Taoism, Confucianism, Chinese culture. Then I found that actually there was a noticeable absence of rites and rituals in the Bali scriptures. Hardly anything. Nowadays, monks have been invested with so many priestly pastoral duties. In the Bali scriptures, there's hardly any. But there are also rituals, and the first rituals were actually concerning the Sangha, ordination. At first, it was the Buddha, very simple. When somebody wants to ordain, after listening to his talk, the Buddha will say, Come, bhikkhu, well preached is the Dhamma. Come and practice the Dhamma for the complete ending of suffering. And that's it. You become a bhikkhu. Full ordination. (laughs) So after that, when more and more people became monks, and they got enlightened and awakened, then the Buddha sent them away and said, Okay, you all better go and spread the Dhamma, which is beautiful in the beginning, middle and end. So they all went separate ways, 
And then they also inspired a lot of people who wanted to renounce. And they would bring all these people from all over to come to the Buddha to get ordination. And the Buddha said, oh, well, that's troublesome for you and me, so why don't you ordain them yourselves? And so he gave them a simple formula. You just tell them to recite after you. Buddham Tranangatami, Daman Tranangatami, and so forth, which you all do so often. You would have become monks and nuns. <laughs> That's all, you know. So that was the first ritual for the monks. Then later on, he went on to more and more elaborate procedures because people misbehaved and then he had to introduce rules and regulations to maintain harmony and order in the Sangha, in the community. So there were more and more rules and regulations and more and more elaborate procedures for ordination. Then also another rite that we have is Uposita Day. Uposita is, according to the Buddhist calendar, four times a month. Every fortnight and then in between there's a small Uposita. So every fortnight at that time, there were members of other non-Buddhist renunciants non-Buddhist monastic communities who would congregate and assemble on Uposita Day, on the 14th or 15th or the 7th or the 8th for every month. I say 15th and not 30th or 39th because the Buddhist calendar is not like the Chinese calendar. It's not like 1 to 39 or 1 to 30. It's 1 to 15, 1 to 15, 1 to 14, 1 to 15, and so forth. So it's on the 14th day, 15th or the 7th or the 8th. They would assemble and probably there was some Dhamma discussion among themselves. Somebody went to the Buddha and asked him to allow the Buddhist monks to gather. Initially, they didn't gather. Initially, they were more like hermits. They were all doing their own thing. Everybody was meditating in the early days. So the Buddha allowed the monks to gather. The monks gathered, assembled on Uposutta Day, but they didn't talk to one another or maintain noble silence. <laughs> sat together and meditated. Then people who were used to what the other non-Buddhist monastics did came expecting to have a Dhamma talk or Dhamma discussion. But the monks were just seated there, maintaining noble silence, probably meditating. And so the people complained. Say, what are these monks doing? They come together and sit like dumb animals. <laughs> Word got to the Buddha, and then the Buddha said, okay, I allow you monks when you assemble on Uposita Day to give Dhamma talk or have a Dhamma discussion. You see? So things developed. And then later on, on Uposita Days also, they would recite the Patimoka. The Patimoka is a code of conduct for monks and nuns. So this became also another ritual. Then later, at the end of the three months rainy season retreat, the monks also have another ritual that's called Pawarana, where you invite one another for mutual criticism. The invitation is like that. Venerable members of the Sangha, I invite the venerables to admonish me or criticize me if I've done anything which you have seen or heard or suspected. And please do that out of compassion for me. So although you look at the spirit of it, it's very commendable, isn't it? but hardly anyone practices it nowadays. They just go there and recite and then finish, that's all. <laughs> Nobody dares to say anything to anybody else, <laughs> especially to the abbot. <laughs> but we do practice that in SPS. That's because we have a small community. If you have a big community, then it's not so easy. Okay, so there's another ritual. The third ritual is Katina. Katina has really become not only a ritual, but also a major celebration and fundraising event for most monasteries and temples. Actually, it's a very simple ceremony that's confined just to monks. Somehow, things got blown up. Then lay people got involved, and that's how it has developed into a very big international sort of uh, festival. But that was also a ritual. Now, surprisingly, although... Monks nowadays are seen doing a lot of blessing ceremonies. In the scriptures themselves, in the Pali scriptures, there were no rituals prescribed for the Sangha, even to give the three refuges or to give the five or eight precepts. You do it yourself. You don't have to go in front of a monk and then request for the refuges or the precepts. 
In fact, during the Buddha's time, they don't do it as diligently as you do. Because you do it on every major occasion. Major occasion in an, a Buddhist event. Before you give a Dhamma talk, every morning you come, every evening you do your puja, right? And then you do the Buddha, Saranga, Chami and all that. During the Buddha's time, they did it only once. Let me give you a sample of how they do it. What would happen is somebody would come and listen to the Buddha giving a Dhamma talk. And then at the end of the Dhamma talk, or in the middle of the Dhamma talk, that person might achieve the Dhamma eye. While listening, he got the Dhamma eye, he had an insight into the Dhamma, became a Sotapan or Sakadagami or an Agami or an Arahant. Or he could just be inspired. And at the end of the discourse, that person would approach the Buddha and would say, Magnificent, Master Gautama, or Bhante, magnificent. Just as if he were to place upright what was overturned, to reveal what was hidden, to show the way to one who was lost, or to carry a lamp into the dark so that those with eyes could see forms. In the same way, Master Gautama, the Blessed One, through many lines of reasoning, made the Dhamma clear. Then I go to Master Gotama for refuge, to the Dhamma and to the community of monks. May Master Gotama, or the Blessed One, remember me as a male or female lay follower who has gone for refuge from this day forward for life. So it's just a one-time thing. You do that once for life. You don't have to do that every day, twice a day. You don't really need to ask a Sangha member to witness your taking of refuge. So, what you are chanting nowadays, the Buddha Sarananga Chami formula, was not used by lay people during the Buddha's time. This was actually used for ordination. <laughs> used for ordination, you know, bhikkhu ordination initially, and later downgraded to Samanera ordination. Now, that is how they do Buddha Sarananga Chami. Lay people don't do that. They just say, I go to the Buddha of our refuge, to the Dhamma, and to the community of monks. And if the Buddha is around, he will say, please regard me as a lay follower from the day onwards for life. Now, it's interesting how this happens also. After the Buddha had passed away, or even when the Buddha was still alive, and there was a lay disciple who heard a Dhamma talk given by another monk, then he would similarly be very impressed and then he would go for refuge. But then instead of saying the Buddha, he would say, I go to Ayasma for refuge, to the Dhamma and to the community of monks. Then the monk would say, please don't take refuge in me. Take refuge in my teacher, the Buddha. So we don't take refuge in the monk. We take refuge in the Buddha, even though the Buddha is not present. When the Buddha has passed away, then the person would rephrase it and say, I'll take refuge in the Buddha, Gautama Buddha, although he has already attained Parinibbana, not in the monk. Okay, so there were no rituals. Because this thing about taking refuge regularly was never in the scriptures. In the scriptures, only a one-time event. Then there's also another interesting thing. I was very surprised to hear of this. In fact, I heard this in a Dhamma talk given by a Thai monk. He says that before a monk gives a Dhamma talk, he must be invited through a special formula. You all know, isn't it? Some of you would know there's a special chanting to request a monk to give a Dhamma talk. And if you don't chant that request to give a Dhamma talk, and the monk should give the Dhamma talk, then it's a vinya offense. First time in my life I ever heard about it. <laughs> there's nothing like that at all. So you can see how Buddhist procedures change to time and culture. I don't know how it changed to that. It got into that form in Thailand. But I was going to the chanting book last night and I found that, well, it's part of Thai culture to have a lot of formalities and rituals. So they have chanting for requesting a monk to give a Dhamma talk, chanting to request a monk to give blessings, chanting to request a monk to give protection, all these things which are not found in the suttas. So what do they chant to request a monk to give a Dhamma talk? 
They chant the verses that were spoken by Brahma Sahampati when he requested the Buddha to start preaching. Because the newly enlightened, awakened Buddha at first was reluctant to teach because he realized that the Dhamma was so profound and many beings had so much defilements. So if he preached Dhamma and people don't understand, then it will be a waste of time and energy. So he was sort of saying, oh, why bother about all these defiled beings? Just stay by myself and enjoy the bliss of Nibbana. <laughs> and then Brahma Sahampati came down and made a request to the Buddha. And they chant this request, which is actually made to the Buddha, not to us. So it's really out of context. There's also no such thing as morning or evening puja done by the monks themselves. Although nowadays, in many monasteries in Burma, Sri Lanka and Thailand, monks do a lot of chanting. Morning chanting, evening chanting. In fact, the Buddha at one time was going around the monastery and he saw monks staying together and he was not very pleased. He criticized the monks for staying together and he said that the monks should actually live in seclusion. Don't stay together. Go and stay by yourself in your own kuti or under the foot of a tree and do your own thing. However, having said that, one of the factors for the growth of the Bhikkhu Sangha is for the Sangha to assemble regularly. Assemble regularly in harmony and rise up in harmony. But how regular is regular? Should it be every day or should it be just once a fortnight? That really depends on the monastery. I think there are some good points also in the monks of a monastery coming together in the evening at least once a day so that there is a sense of togetherness and the abbot or the head monk will be able to give advice to the members of the Sangha. There are some big monasteries also where hundreds of or even a thousand monks who stay together there and they don't have this spirit anymore because it's so huge. So what they do in some good monasteries is that they divide into various chapters, maybe a group of 20 or 30 per chapter, and then there is someone in charge there. So that becomes more personalized. Or it becomes very impersonal to have the abbot talking to 1,000 monks. He doesn't know who is who. The next thing is monks are particularly very well sought for a high demand for conducting bereavement services and memorial services. Is that not so? A lot of Sri Lankan monks are imported from Sri Lanka to do just that, one after another, because so many people die. <laughs> so many people die because so many bereavement and memorial services. So if you want to provide that sort of service, the monks will be very busy. They will be going in and out. Again, this is not something that can be found in the scriptures. The scriptures do not have any case where a monk is asked to go for a bereavement service. Monks are invited when people are sick to console the lay people, to try to encourage and inspire them to practice the Dhamma. Now, I want to relate an interesting thing that happened in Sri Lanka. What I'm going to say is a paraphrase of what was said by quite a senior don, lecturer, professor, who is a Sri Lankan himself. Monks are supposed to stay in monasteries, right? And what do monks do? Actually, they learn the Dhamma, transmit the Dhamma among themselves, try to practice, and then preach to the people. But in Sri Lanka, the monks are called priests, and the monasteries are called temples. By whom? By the colonialists when they came. When the colonialists came to Sri Lanka, they went around and they didn't see monks, they saw priests. <laughs> they didn't see monasteries, they saw temples. You know what that means? Because the monks were all so busy doing priestly duties. They were all priests. You could hardly find any monk who were actually doing a monkish duty like meditating or learning the scriptures. So that's why you have this title, Chief High Priest of This and That. <laughs> so even in Malaysia, you see people talking about going to Buddhist temples. Yeah? But they are actually not temples, you know. Temples is a place of worship. And priests are people who do pastoral duties, priestly duties like rites and rituals for bereavement and memorial service, blessings for marriage, for housewarming. In Thailand and in Indonesia, 
which actually emulated Thai custom. They have a chanting book full of different chants for different occasions. When a Buddhist is born, when you cut the hair, when you want to do something to the ears, on a birthday, when you want to open shop, a new car, there are different things, got different chanting, all these rites and rituals. But these are not in the Pali scriptures. Another thing that monks were never found doing in the Pali scriptures is leading the sharing of merits and making aspirations. I think many of you already know how to share your own merits. But I see that when it comes to making aspiration, people pause and wait for the monk to lead them. As though you cannot make your own aspiration. You are the one who's going to Nibbana. You do your own aspiration. <laughs> okay, so you see, why did this happen? There was a theory that was postulated by the very senior professor. It is because of the influence of Brahmanism. The Brahmins were priests. They were priests by birth. And they were supposed to be the intermediaries between man and the divine. So if any Hindu wanted to make any sacrifice or make any offerings to the divine, they just cannot do it directly. They must go through a Brahmin, an intermediary. So that's how they earn a living. That's how they tantya. That's how they become very influential. So even the kings, when they want to make any offerings, they have to invite the Brahmin to go through them to reach the divine. So that's why they become a class of people who hold power, merely by birth. But of course, when a Brahmin child is born, he will have to go through the training to execute all these duties. So what happened was when Buddhism came to Sri Lanka, there was probably already a lot of Brahmanistic belief because it's so near to India. And so there was a vacuum in strict core Buddhist teachings because the monks were not priests. They didn't do any rituals. Right? The Brahmins are always doing rituals for the people. Any occasion, they will ask the Brahmin to come to do rituals. And now the monks don't do anything. They just meditate, learn the scriptures and teach. Because of this vacuum, gradually the monks had more and more duties to perform. More and more duties, pastoral duties to perform for the sake of their supporters. So that's how it happened. And that's what is happening right now. Also, in the Pali scriptures, the monks were not in any way seen to be reciting paritas for the lay people. You recite your own parita. In fact, in the Atanatiya Sutta, in Diganikaya, the sutta where the Atanatiya parita is found, then the four great kings came to see the Buddha one day. That is a story in the Diganikaya. King Vesavana, the king of the Yakas of the northern direction, he was supposed to be a Sotapan, so he was a Buddhist. He came and told the Buddha that there are demons and yakas who are not Buddhists and who are not sympathetic towards the Buddhist cause. And they might cause mischief and disturb or assault Buddhist practitioners, whether they are renunciants, monastics or lay people. So he suggested to the Buddha that it would be good if Buddhists, whether they are monastics or lay people, learn this Atanatiya Parita. He made a promise that if a Buddhist, whether a monastic or a lay follower, should recite this Atanatiya Parita regularly and still be molested or harassed by demons or yakas, then they can recite the whole Atanatiya Sutta, which is like lodging a complaint to the four great kings. <laughs> because inside there, after the Atanatiya Parita, there's a part which names all the generals. So he's reporting to all the generals of the Yaka army. King Vesavana promised that despite reciting this parita regularly, if a Buddhist should still be harassed by any Yaka, then you recite this whole sutta and we will come and help. You will catch hold of the fellow and, <laughs> and punish him. <laughs> okay, but this is not asking a monk to chant for you, you know. The prerequisite is that you must chant it yourself. If you chant it yourself regularly and still you are harassed, then you can make a complaint and they will come and help you. It doesn't mean that we chant for you, you know, you chant yourself. <laughs> Another parita is found in the Vinaya. This one is the Kanda parita. The Kanda parita came about because a monk was bitten by a snake and he died. And the Buddha said, 
monks. If this monk had chanted this parita, then he would not have died. Which doesn't mean that he wouldn't be bitten by the snake. He could have been bitten by the snake, but he wouldn't die. (laughs) So that's why he gave this parita. And so this is also something which you chant for yourself, not somebody chanting for you. So these are actually the two main paritas that are found. Another one is the Angulimala parita. But that one is really a wonderful one. That was actually given to Aisma Angulimala himself before he became an Arhan or even a Sotapan. That was because although Angulimala was infamous for his slaughtering of so many people, after he became a monk, he was moved to compassion when he saw a pregnant woman undergoing labor pains. Imagine he had killed so many people and then seeing a pregnant woman <laughs> undergoing labor pains, he was moved by compassion. So he came to tell the Buddha and the Buddha told him, well, in that case, you recite this. It's actually an asseveration of truth. He says, Sister, from the day I was born until now, I have not deliberately taken any life. By the power of this truth, may you and your baby be safe. Then, Asma Anguli Mara told the Buddha, but one day I'll be telling a lie if I say that. How can it be true? So the Buddha rephrased it and said, from the day of my noble birth, <laughs> noble birth meaning not that he has already become a Sotapan, that time he has not attained yet. Noble birth means becoming a monk. From the day he became a monk, he has not intentionally taken life. So by the power of this truth, may you and your baby be safe. This one was given to Asma Angulimara himself. But very strangely, anyone can recite it and it still works. <laughs> I've recited it many times and it works so many times. Sometimes I wonder how it works. <laughs> and it's not reciting in front. Sometimes it's a distant station. I recite it in my office, but the lady is in the maternity ward. <laughs> and still, the fetus can turn. It's just amazing. Another thing is the Ratana Sutta. You all heard of Ratana Sutta, right? Well, there's a story about Ratana Sutta where Vesali was hit by a famine and also there were lots of yakas who were eating up a lot of people. But this is a common terror story. There's no story to the Ratana Sutta in the Pali Canon itself. So in that story, they invited Asma Ananda and the Sangha to recite this Ratana Sutta. But this is a common terror story. Nothing stated in the actual Pali Canon about the background for this Ratana Sutta. So let me now talk about rituals for lay Buddhists because all the rituals I talked about were supposed to be concerning monks. But now, what sort of rituals are lay Buddhists required to do? Actually, none at all. <laughs> you don't have to do any rituals. All you need to do is really understand who the Buddha is and then have strong faith and belief that the Buddha was truly, perfectly self-awakened and the Dhamma he taught is according to his experience and is true. And there are people who have practiced according to the Dhamma and have similarly become awakened. Then you try to put the Dhamma into practice. That's all you need to do. Not much rituals. But rituals has got its advantages as well, has got its pros and cons. People as a whole love liturgy. Humans are a gregarious lot. They like to come together and coming together to do things together gives you inspiration. Right? It gives you um, strength, group energy. Particularly if you are someone who is not very steadfast in your will. You are not a very strong-willed person. It's good to come together as a community and be inspired by others around you. But don't get caught up in those rites and rituals too much that you forget that being a good Buddhist means to actually practice the Dharma. So, like I said the other day, last week, don't get too concerned about different ways of chanting and different procedures, different chants. These are not really very important. The most important thing is to actually practice the Dharma and see the Dharma within yourself. Now, talking about rites and rituals, you probably would have heard of a Sotapan being free from clinging to any rites and rituals, right? The Pali word is sila bata. Sila bata pramasa. Pramasa means to grasp at. Vata means any sort of duty. 
And sila means a habit. And instead of clinging to habits or duties, thinking that by observing these observances and practices will take you to Nibbana or will give you liberation. This does not mean that a Sotapan will not do morning chanting or evening chanting, morning and evening puja. Or he will not pay respect to the Buddha image. Or that he will not burn a candle or offer flowers to the Buddha. Or these are all rites and rituals, right? Yeah, offering flowers and water and food to the Buddha is also very alien to the Pali scriptures because in the Pali scriptures, there were no Buddha images. The Buddha image came only more than 500 years after the Buddha had passed away. So if there was any puja, puja was done to that person who is still alive. Just before the Buddha passed away, he said that the highest puja that you could do to honor me is by practicing the Dhamma according to the Dhamma. Not making all these offerings of flowers and perfumes and music and so forth. These are all worldly things. Although a Sotapan will not cling on to any of these rites and rituals, if he is by nature a very devout person, the faith faculty is very predominant in him or her, then he or she will still continue to do all these things out of reverence, out of maybe gratitude to the Buddha. But knowing fully that just by making offerings of flowers and water and food to the Buddha image is not the path that will lead him out of liberation. This is just an expression of gratitude, expression of faith, yeah? but not the path that will lead you out of samsara. So depending on each person's individual capacity, then you have to practice the Dhamma accordingly. All right? So that's why we have all these Buddhist temples, big, big Buddha images, because the majority of Buddhists are faith-oriented. They tend to gravitate towards such things that there's a form for them to look at. For intellectuals, the faith faculty may not be so strong. For them, it is the Dhamma itself, reading the suttas, trying to understand the Dhamma intellectually and trying to put that into practice. So the role of rituals and rites in a Buddhist life should be kept to the minimum. Don't get caught up in all these things and remember that the essence of the Buddha's teaching is in understanding the Dhamma within yourself. Last week I talked about looking back at the Dhamma within yourself to understand the defilements that arise in you and to see how they come about because of causes and conditions through your own personal experience. Because that is how the Buddha said that the Dhamma is to be seen by oneself, immediate, worthy of inviting one to come to see for him or herself, leads inwards, and it is also to be experienced by the wise. So I hope that you will all try to understand the Dhamma in that way, through your own personal experience, and not put too much time and effort in the performing of rites and rituals. Okay? Let me stop here, and if there's anyone who wants to ask any questions, please feel free to do so. Yes. I would like to know what is the function of the paritas, how it works actually. The function of the paritas is to protect. That's why it's called parita, protection. Protection supposedly comes by chanting, if you understand what you are chanting and if you really have a good heart when you chant it. That means to say that you are not trying to gain anything out of somebody for doing that. For example, if you are a monk and you are chanting for somebody, you are not chanting so that you can get gifts in return. You are chanting in order to alleviate suffering or to give real protection. That is the purpose of Paritas. Having said that, the Atanatiya Parita, which I talked about, found in the Diga Nikaya, a lot of it is about paying respect to the Buddhas, the seven Buddhas, and also extolling the greatness of the four great kings, Chattu Maharajika, the four great kings of the Devas. So, basically that's all. By just doing that, it's a Parita, it's supposed to be a protection. Okay. question in regards to monk giving blessings. 
technically by this it is the monks so bless okay. but can we say that the words that chanted is the power of the chanting that does the blessing to the people who have done merits and uh, because it's chanted by a, a virtuous person is even more effective I don't think so. I think if somebody has done merits, then the power would lie in the act of doing that merit. That is the karma. That's why you should believe in. You should believe in the karma rather than in the blessing. If you believe in the blessing and not in the karma, then you are a dirty upasaka. <laughs> As I told you, we don't give you blessings. We give thanksgiving. In the way we say, oh, may you be well and happy, may all the devas protect you. I mean, this is just a wish. It's not necessarily a real blessing. It doesn't mean that just by saying that, all the devas will protect you. <laughs> but at least the words that is chanted has a psychological effect on the devotee who has performed his marriage. <laughs> Maybe it's a placebo effect. But actually, there's nowhere in the suttas that any efficacy of blessings is mentioned. The monks chant the scriptures in order to memorize so that they can pass on to the next generation or to their pupils, or they chant in order to understand how to practice. <laughs> Many of the blessings that you hear nowadays are not found in the Pali scriptures. These are all invented by monks later, much later. Even the one Ichitam patitam trihang, whatever that is desired by you, may it be fulfilled like the full moon on a full moon day, you know. That one is found in the commentary. But the Bhavadu Sabha Mangalang is not found anywhere. Okay, anyone else? Chanting goes in the four pairs of uh, sayings. So, we're taking a fish in the Sangha. Tawandomi means it's the sangha that you trust and that you uh, listen to follow the teachings. Uh, is it that or is it, uh, some people say it's all the sangha of, you know, taking refuge in... Okay, you missed my talk last week. You try to elaborate on that. So last week, I made a decision between the triple gem and the three refuges. First gem is the Buddha. That Buddha refers to all Buddhas could be Bogotama Buddha, could be Kasapa Buddha, whatever. And then the second gem refers to Nibbana. Dhamma here, the Dhamma as a gem, refers to Nibbana and the Samadhi of an Arahant. Okay? Then the third jewel, the third gem, the Sangha, refers to the Arya Sangha, those who are enlightened, awakened, the four pairs of individuals, as you said just now. But we don't take refuge in them. Maybe in the first one, yeah, but only in one, in the Gautama Buddha. Because the other Buddhas, we don't know. We know the other Buddhas only through Gautama Buddha. You cannot take refuge in the Dhamma, which is Nibbana or an Arahant's Samadhi, because you are not an Arahant and you have not realized Nibbana. So how can you take refuge in it? <laughs> right? And thirdly, the Arya Sangha, the awakened ones. If you take refuge in them, how are you going to identify who is an Arya? <laughs> right? Then when you have some problems, you want to go and consult somebody, you have a problem trying to figure out who is an Arya. <laughs> okay, so these are the gems, triple gem. We don't take refuge in them, but we admire them, we gain inspiration from them. Okay? So we take refuge in Gautama Buddha, who was the one who rediscovered the truth and then revealed it to us expounded the truth to us. We take refuge in the Dhamma, which are his Dhamma teachings. Not Nibbana, not the Samadhi of an Arahant, but his teachings. And then we take refuge in the Bhikkhu Sangha, because the Bhikkhu Sangha was the one who preserved the teachings of the Buddha for more than 2,500 years. Before the first century AD, from the Buddha's time until the first century AD, there were no books, nothing was written, everything was memorized and transmitted from generation to generation. And it was the monks who did that, not the lay people. And so we take refuge in the Bhikkhu Sangha, who are supposed to be the transmitters and preservers of the Buddha's teachings, and who are supposed to be experts in the teachings and to practice them. 
Okay, so we take refuge in the Bhikkhu Sangha, not in the Ariya Sangha. Is that clear to you? Uh, yeah, so I'm thinking because uh, not all the Sangha, you know, may be practicing properly or whatever, so we take refuge in that, or, you know, I mean. Okay, so you try to look for a member of the Sangha whom you think is knowledgeable and respectable. Yeah. Don't just take refuge in a Pasamala monk. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, what about the bowing that we do to the Buddha image and to the monks that come? Is that also a rite and ritual? During the Buddha's time also they bow. Whenever the monk comes to see the Buddha, he will bow. People will come to listen to the Dhamma talk, depending on your faith. Some people will bow, some people will just introduce themselves, some people will just stand in one corner and listen. But Bowing three times and in a specific way is not mentioned in the suttas. I like to ask people, why are you bowing three times? And they say, to the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. And then I said, okay, well, before I came, you already bowed three times to the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha. When I come in, you bow three times to me again, to the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. So are you paying respect to the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha or to me? And nobody really knows actually what it really means to do it three times. <laughs> in the scriptures, in the Bali Canon, the number of times is not mentioned. It just says that the monk comes to the Buddha's presence and then pays respect. That's all. He didn't say bow three times. And then to bow in a certain way, the five point prostration and all that, that is also not found anywhere. <laughs> so I learned this from a strange person. He is a Chinese Filipino who is a Christian and who teaches Tibetan pranic healing. I think this comes from the Tibetans because it says that they pay respect three times, not bowing like us, but they put their hands up above the crown and then one here, the forehead, and one here. So they say with gratitude, respect, and love. I think that's more meaningful to me. When I bow to the Buddha, I bow with gratitude for his wonderful teachings. Second bow, with respect, for your wonderful conduct and virtues. And we love for being such a wonderful teacher. Right? Don't you think that's more meaningful? So when you bow to a monk or so, you do the same thing. You bow out of gratitude, respect and love. Not bow to the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, to the Buddha image, and then the monk comes again, you bow to Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. <laughs> it doesn't seem to make much sense to me. Okay, anyone else? Is ceremony or a ritual? It's a custom. It's a Chinese custom. No, because it says it's custom, yes. But then people are offering, they buy either in vegetable or if not, they buy chickens and whatever not. And then they, after that, they burn the, the, uh, the gold paper. So, is that a ritual? If it's a ritual, then should we, as a practicing Buddhist, practice it or we just ignore it? But family members are doing it. Are we going to participate or are we just going to just walk away? This is actually found in the Sigalo Wada Sutta, in the Diganigaya, where the Buddha gave a lot of pointers on how to relate to different people in the world, how the husband and wife should relate with one another, how the teacher and the pupil should relate to one another, how a child and the parents should relate to one another. And one of the duties is to make regular offerings to departed ones. Okay? And this concept of sharing marriage that we have nowadays is not really found in the Pali Suttas. In the Pali Suttas, it's more of material offerings to the departed ones. And in the Tirokuddha Sutta, in the Kudaka Nikaya, Kudaka Pata, the front part of it, 10 verses of it, is all about making material offerings to the departed one. Only the last two verses talk about inviting the Sangha and sharing merits. Not really sharing merits, so inviting the Sangha and getting merits out of that. Okay? So it's the custom, which is also part of Indian custom, which the Buddha did not prevent people from doing. In fact, he encouraged them to do as part of your know, filial piety or respect for elders. Okay, somebody else wanted to ask. Me. 
Bhante, after hearing your thoughts on the rights of ritual, as lay people, at what degree do we have to follow? Because based on the sutta, practically nothing you need to follow. If nothing you have to follow, then besides, as you say, uh, for gathering purposes, for exploration purposes, then how, how do individual Buddhists do, you know, in various temples and various ways? So as, uh, as an individual person, as a lay person, do we follow? We don't follow? Or what? At what degree would you think is acceptable and non-acceptable? First of all, you must ask yourself why you go to the temples. What is the reason? Ask yourself and you conduct yourself according to what your objective is. Are you going there for fellowship? Are you going there for blessings? Are you going there for what? <laughs> okay? And then it is basically a very individual thing. I personally never like rites and rituals. And the thing that attracted me to Theravada Buddhism is precisely because there is an absence of rites and rituals. I really loathe all those Mahayana and Tibetan rites and rituals. Even in Theravada, like now, we go to each uh, Theravada temple, we still have to have a flight and ritual, quite uh, our, our, not the necessary thing. So, uh, what would uh, an individually people do? You know, can we actually come here and don't follow and don't bow and you know that kind of thing? Or is it we do it because that temple has certain rites and ritual and we have to follow? Or do we do based on the scriptures uh, there is none? In Rome, do as the Romans do. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> but it's good to know that these are all just superficial stuff. The main thing is your heart, looking at it. You can do this, but don't cling to them as though they are the actual practice of Buddhism. Yes, somebody else? Yes. From last week's talk, the one about the Ratana, the Buddhist, or the Deplorable the, the Thing, the fourth and the fifth factors were about them seeking outside of the Sangha and giving priorities to them. How do you view that in terms of contemporary now? Like now we have secular type of things versus interfaith type of things and people who are on a future search, but we search outside first. And then how do you view that in our modern times? These factors, four and five, are basically about Merit making, making merits. And if you think that you can get more merits by making offerings to someone who is not a member of the Buddhist Sangha, then that is fulfilling the factor of being a dirty Obasaka. Right? But if it's not about making merits, it's about participating in an interforum thing or looking for other aspects of truth in somewhere else, it's not the same. It's not about making merits, it's about seeking truth. Okay?